Hey friends, my name is Pastor Justin Kim, and it's a privilege to be with you over Zoom during this camp meeting presentation. I want to encourage you to take out your Bibles wherever you are, and whether it's a digital copy or a analog copy, it's great to have a, the Word of God with you, especially as we're engaging here on Zoom, to have the Word of God before you, and you can have multiple interaction points with, with the Word of God. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get started into the message proper. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you once again for the platform of Zoom. We thank you for your blessings throughout this pandemic. And as your people gather together, Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be poured out through this medium, through the message. And Father, transcend all this and do what only you can do. Bless the message here today. And we ask for a blessing that only you can give, a unique blessing, a strange blessing. Speak to each one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The message will start in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, please, please, please turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It should be a verse that you're very familiar with already. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. This is a, the famous sermon of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, and the, right in the middle is chapter 6, verse 33. We sing the song, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. We know this verse. But let's look at a little bit more the context of where Jesus shares this promise. Um, in order to understand Hebrew thought, some of us in the West uh, may understand Hebrew thought if we read it backwards. Okay, so we'll start in verse 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Verse 32. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Here Jesus is making a political statement, a nationalistic statement, rather. Uh, he's defining the difference between Gentiles, who are non-Jews, and Jews and characterizing these two groups. Each uh, kingdom, each culture, each nation has particular attributes about it that make it uniquely what it is. Uh, for example, I am of, uh, from America, from the United States, and there's unique things about Americans, as many of you Canadians may, may, may point out. Uh, my background is also from Korea, South Korea, and there's unique aspects about South Korea. Uh, many of you out there are Canadians, and uh, there's unique things, unique attributes uh, about Canadians. What are they? These are things that are, it's a fun discussion to have. have. Uh, one thing that is very interesting is what defines a culture is often what it is afraid of. For example, in Scandinavia, the Norway and uh, Denmark and Sweden, they're very cognizant and very mindful of the environment and the ecology. They're afraid of global warming. So it defines a lot of their behaviors, a lot of their values, and uh, a lot of their cultural assets. Uh, the Germans are usually afraid of being late, and so they're usually on time. Um, Italians are afraid of bad food. French, uh, the French are afraid of messing up relationships. The British are afraid of bad etiquette, and uh, there are they have Americans who, according to different different, depending on which American that you talk to, uh, is afraid of no longer being number one anymore. I know it's a controversial topic, but that's what many sociologists and, and anthropologists say. Just for fun, here's some what other cultures are afraid of. In the Philippines, apparently, there is a fear of wearing red in a thunderstorm, according to some cultural or whatever uh, folklore that lightning is attracted to the color red. In Ecuador, there's the fear of refrigerator air, that some people in Ecuador will open the refrigerator, or before they open the refrigerator rather, that they will hold their breath and they'll open the refrigerator, take out what they need, and they close it and they breathe again. In South Korea, we have the fear of fans. Electric fans, that especially when you're sleeping at night, that they don't want it turning, they don't want the fan on all night because it may mess with your breathing while you're sleeping, and there's reported these fan deaths. It's, it's a weird phenomenon. What are you afraid of? What are Canadians afraid of? What are 
British Columbians afraid of? What are, if, whether you're from Vancouver or from Hope or from the North, what are you specific, specifically afraid of? This is the topic what Jesus is, 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 is addressing here. And in this passage in chapter 6, you see that Jesus mentions, don't be afraid, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And he says that five times. And then he says, and then and the climate, well, let's go here. In verse 25, he says, don't worry. Verse 27, why are you worried? Verse 28, why are you worried? Verse 31, do not worry then. Verse 34, so do not worry. So in this context, what Jesus is essentially saying here is this. You couple the worry with the Gentiles and the Jews. And so verse 32, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Let's put that together. The Gentiles or other cultures, they have specific fears. And in order to overcome these fears, they seek certain things. Get that? What are you seeking? Rather, what are you afraid of? And what are you seeking that compensates for that fear? Is it prestige? Is it income? Is it stable family? Is it spouse? Is it degrees, whatever, it's, it's, it's whatever these things are. These are naturally seeded in the human heart. And each culture has a different thing that pops up. For example, in many Asian cultures, education is a big thing. Prestige is a big thing. Honor is a big thing. Why? If you look at the history of things, and there's a reason for all the, uh, uh, for this, that, that many families want to get that honor, want to get that prestige to compensate for the poverty and for the shame that they have experienced in the past. Here, Jesus says, Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. And what Jesus is saying in verse 33, he's defining a new kingdom, a new culture, a new people group, if you will. And this people group is not like the Scandinavians and the Filipinos and the, the Koreans and the Americans and the Canadians. They're defined by having no fear at all. They don't worry. Well, why is that? Verse 33, one more time. All these things will be added unto you. Well, why do they believe that? Verse 32 says, For they believe their heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. What are all these things? All these things is, is a statement that God the Father is omniscient and He knows that you have need of, uh, need of all these things. Now, if you worry and you seek all these things, you're essentially saying, God you don't know my needs. You don't know what I need. So therefore, I'm going to seek it out myself because you are not omniscient. That's what we're saying with our lives. Jesus counsels us in verse 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Number one, seek. How many of you have ever lost your phones, your keys, your wallet? This word for seek is not a passive look. It's not a gaze upon and just kind of stumble across. It is an, an intense imperative to, to seek something out with all of your heart, all of your energy, that you're focused on this one thing. When you're seeking your keys, you drop everything. Life essentially stops, it's paused, until you find your keys, because otherwise you can't drive. You can't, if you lose your phone, you can't communicate with anyone. So you stop everything that you're doing. And that's your number one thing that you're looking for. Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Those two things become the objective for the Christian. Well, what is his kingdom? The English root word is the king's dominion or the king's land. Yeah. Do we need to seek out more real estate for the Lord Jesus? Are we out there looking for more property and buying church buildings and whatnot? No. God owns all the properties in the universe. But rather, His kingdom is not on the outside, but His kingdom is the winning of souls. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. 
Another word for righteousness is the character of God, God's goodness, God's uh, purity, God's uh, righteousness, His justice, all these attributes of God's character. So these are the two things, seeking souls and seeking Jesus' character. Interesting, these two things are the only two things that we bring up to heaven when we go when Jesus, when Jesus comes up, up to, and when Jesus comes and we meet up in heaven, these are the only two things that we bring uh, with us. So when we choose our majors, when we choose the classes that we go to for university, when we choose which house to buy, which job to 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 work in, uh, which when we choose spouses, we're not looking at uh, resale value or how pretty our husband or wife is or what uh, will be most beneficial for my career. Rather, we're looking at, does this make me more like Jesus? And how can I win more souls through this? Let me give you some examples. When we're choosing a class, we're not choosing the classes just so that we finish the major and get a bachelor's or a master's. Rather, what's first in our minds is, how can I win souls? We choose classes and we choose even the seats that we sit in to win souls, to help our fellow classmates and, and encourage them to the kingdom of God. We choose classes that make us more like Jesus and His character is reflected. We choose homes, mortgages. We choose jobs based on evangelistic potential. We choose spouses that help us become more like Jesus or help become partners in evangelism rather than just finding the most prettiest person or the most handsome or the richest uh, spouse out there. This is what it means to seek ye first in terms of priority and the motive that we have in making decisions in all the large decisions that we make in life is putting Jesus' character and souls first in our decision-making process. Here's the promise. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. And by the way, all these things, having a good spouse, having a good mortgage, a house, a job, a education, all these things, it's good, it's okay. They're not necessarily bad. But Jesus says, I'm repeating the same thing, your Father knows that you have need of all these things, but seek first His kingdom as righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Another way of saying this is there's something that is central and there's something that is peripheral. With my peripheral vision, I can, while I'm still staring at the, cent the, the central figure of this finger, I can still see through my peripheral vision this finger on the side. The question is, what is central in your life and what is peripheral in your life? For many Christians, we are seeking all these things in front of us, and in Jesus, the kingdom of God and His righteousness, is peripheral. And what Jesus is saying is, you're not really a Christian. You're really a Gentile. But for this new kingdom that God is inaugurating in the Sermon on the Mount, He says that these people have God first, His character, and the souls that, are, that need to be won to the kingdom. That is central and spouses, and income, and children, grandchildren, and all these other things that are not bad, and we need these things also, but that's not central in our lives. It's peripheral. Said in another way, Jesus is giving you the greatest uh, deal in the universe. He says, he's basically saying, if you try to get all these things, you won't get it. And we see this proven over and over by all of Hollywood and all of the sports stars and movie stars and whatever who attain to the world's standards of greatness and whatnot, and they're still not fulfilled. Jesus is saying, you try to get all these things, you can't. But if you make me first, I will give you those things that you need in your heart. And that's Jesus' ultimate promise to each one of us. Now, he's, if you can continue to go backwards, he says, verse 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. Now, we're going kind of backwards, yeah? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. The Gentiles seek all these things. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And what Jesus is saying is this. There's some of you out there. There's some of you out there who continue to insist, no, I'm still going to seek all these things. And what Jesus is saying is watch out because three things will happen to all the things that we try to seek on this earth. Number one, Jesus says in verse 19, moths will get at it. Now, not literally moths, yes, but also there's biological decay will happen. My mother, who uh, is originally from South Korea, she had immigrated to the United States and she crossed this ocean and she lived in America and she left my grandmother back home. My grandmother missed my mother so much that every time that she missed her, she would go to the market and buy these expensive clothes, expensive silk blankets and whatnot. And after five or six years, my mother would take the airplane and go and visit my grandmother in Korea. Now, one year, I remember that I went with my, grand- with my mother, we went to Korea, and my grandmother said, oh, how I missed you so much, and I want to show you all the gifts that I have uh, stored up all these years. And we went into her bedroom, and she had this big wardrobe, and she opened it, and then I remember as she opened it, all these moths had come out. And as she took each expensive blanket and silk silk tapestry and, and all these clothes, there are big holes in there. Jesus is saying, whatever you have, it's subject to biological decay. So watch what you put your heart in. Now, some of you are saying, well, I don't invest in clothes that much. I don't invest in things that that, uh, have biological decay. Jesus says in in, in chapter chapter 6, verse 19, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. So number two, Jesus talks about chemical corrosion. This is the second thing to watch out for. I had a friend who invested in, in many electronic, uh, electronic uh, things. He had and the latest Apple versions of everything, and he had all this you know, equipment and accoutrement that, that just was the most expensive, and he invested in these things, and he would sell them on eBay and whatnot. And then in one night, a storm had come in, and there was a big flood, and all that equipment had gotten waterlogged, but moreover, it had rusted, and it was beyond repair. And he was, just, he was just distressed beyond his mind. Jesus would have said, do not put your heart in these things because they experience chemical corrosion. Number two. Now some of you are saying, well, I don't invest in things where there's biological decay, biological decay or chemical corrosion. I'm going to invest in other things. And this Jesus says here, number three, verse 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and and steal. Number three is, Jesus says, that whatever is left over, that thieves can come in and steal. Many years ago, it was reported that the Queen of England had her bank account hacked into, and some money was stolen. Now, if the Queen of England has had her bank account stolen too, what security do you think you have in your bank account? We're just not talking about bank finances, but also people. People steal your hearts. Relationships, they steal from you as well. What Jesus is saying is this, that nothing in this world is worth it like uh, like God and His kingdom. Now, all these other things are important, but when trusted, when invested, and when placed in God's hands, God will give us all these things. Let me ask you, what are you afraid of? Insurance problems, marriage problems, financial problems, immigration problems, family relationship problems, health problems, church political problems, legal problems, education problems, personal problems. What is it that you're worried about? Focus on that and scratch a little bit underneath that. And underneath that, what is it that you're seeking? 
Are you seeking harmony, peace, riches, prestige, security? What is it that you're after? And then place that in God's hands and move it. Ask God to give you the strength to move it to the peripheral and then place the kingdom of God and his righteousness as central in your lives. You can't do it by your own strength. It's a supernatural work that needs to happen. And my question to you after this message, according to this verse, according to a verse that we have sung for for so long and that we know uh, all the words by heart, how many of you want to say, Lord, help me to do that? Help me not be a Gentile. Help me to no longer be an American, a Korean, a Canadian, uh, no longer this a Gentile on this earth, but help me to be a true disciple follower of the Lord Jesus and recreate my heart so that there's no fear and there's a singular focus on the kingdom of God and His righteousness. How many of you do want to say that? Amen? Let me pray with you right now. Gracious Father, Lord, we ask that you re-scramble and refresh and reorder the priorities and the decision-making values of our minds and our hearts. Bless each of my brothers and sisters out there who are watching, who are on this camp meeting, and Lord, help us, Lord, to fulfill these promises in the Sermon on the Mount in in Matthew chapter 6. Lord, this can only be done by your grace. But before before you work, you ask for our consent. So, Father, right now, we give you our consent. We ask for help. We look towards heaven and we open ourselves to be be, uh, available for the, the grace of heaven to work in our lives. Grant us that focus. Grant us that reordering of the peripheral and the central. And Lord, help us to make you first in our lives. This is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.